My name is Hazel Homer Wambin, and my presentation is on women's suffrage cookbooks, language, food, and history. I'm going to be comparing the differences and similarities between these two cookbooks, looking at the linguistics of the text, analyzing the recipes through a food studies perspective, and hopefully incorporating a little bit of history along the way. Throughout the history of America, women have been fighting for equal rights. This goes for equality at home, in the workplace, in politics, and for women's suffrage. Suffrage being the right to vote, and specifically, what these two cookbooks are supporting. Wyoming was the first state to allow women the right to vote, and this year of 2019 marks the 150th anniversary of this historical milestone that was women's suffrage in Wyoming. This anniversary is one of the reasons this topic is so relevant to today. This year of 2019 also marks the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote in America, which was 50 years after Wyoming passed the law. The historic breakthrough is being celebrated this year all across America. The first cookbook, titled The Women's Suffrage Cookbook, was written in 1886, with all the funds going to the women's suffrage movement. As the editor, Hattie Burr, states, the cookbook is a messenger for the movement. The second cookbook, called The Suffrage Cookbook, was published in 1915, nearly 30 years later. This cookbook had the same general goal, to spread awareness of the movement to the general public and to raise funds. The recipes in both cookbooks are a collection of contributions made by women all across the country who made an impact in the women's suffrage movement. These women were housewives, teachers, mothers, nurses, lawyers, and activists who each contributed unique recipes and thoughts to the cookbooks. Looking at the recipes, I found that while many of them were familiar to me, others were very interesting concoctions. Boiled tongue, mock turtle soup, which was made from veal and calves feet, beef tea, raw beef soaked in hot water, egg lemonade, the recipe calling for raw eggs and lemon juice, and a recipe called chicken jelly. The recipe of chicken jelly is very similar to a recipe called aspic, a dish made popular in America by Julia Child. Julia Child is arguably the most famous female chef in history, writing multiple cookbooks and having her own cooking show. The dish aspic has made its journey across the world, developing many different names and spellings. An early version of aspic is the recipe of sikbaj. Looking at this Egyptian recipe from the 13th century, we can see that the ingredients are very similar to that of aspic and chicken jelly. Exploring these cookbooks from a linguistics perspective, we can look specifically at the word ketchup. In both cookbooks, this word is spelled catsup, which is a reflection of the time period, as words change spelling and pronunciation through time. Another word that is used frequently throughout the first cookbook is the word invalid, to describe someone who is sick or disabled. These two cookbooks also serve as guides for caring for others. In today's context, invalid is considered a slur for someone who is disabled, again reflecting the time period of the cookbooks. I found it funny that throughout the cookbooks, sarcastic recipes are thrown in. While you do have to look hard to find them, they are very inspiring and amusing. This one specifically is called Pie for a Suffragist Doubting Husband, and it has some very sarcastic undertones. In the back of the first women's suffrage cookbook, there is a section titled Eminent Opinions on Women's Suffrage. This section is full of quotes by many famous historical figures, including this quote by Plato, where he states that the gifts of both sexes are equal. Also in this section are quotes from renowned politicians such as Abraham Lincoln and John Quincy Adams, once again, this was a way to use the cookbook as vehicles for promoting women's suffrage and equality in politics.
After further research, I found that these were not the only times cookbooks were used in, for political propaganda. After the 13th Amendment of, to the Constitution was made, abolishing slavery in America, multiple cookbooks were written by African American women to prove that African Americans had the intelligence and drive to write a cookbook. In 1980, a cookbook was written called The Political Palette, a Feminist Vegetarian Cookbook. The book is described as a collection of recipes and a discussion of the politics of feminism. This was a reflection of prominent women in the 1970s and 80s American feminist movement, such as Gloria Steinem. Women's equality is still a much examined issue in America today, shown through the Women's March and the Me Too movement. While much has changed since the 18 and 1900s, women are still fighting for their rights in America, building off the inspirational women who came before us. In the cooking industry, many female chefs have made their impact. Women such as Rachel Ray and Martha Stewart have become powerful businesswomen who own their own companies and brands. They each voice their political opinions publicly and have become iconic inspirations. In conclusion, a cookbook can tell a story, whether that is through the linguistics of the text, the study of food and recipes, or in this case, through the history of women's equal rights in America, a fight we are still fighting today.